Today I'm gonna to be showing you how to build a bike out of a box. So the bike we're gonna be assembling today is a pretty typical mountain bike. It's a Schwinn Axum DP. I've got one already built. I've got one right there in the box that we're gonna be building today. But the video today is gonna to show you everything about all bikes in general. So I'm gonna show you things on this bike and then I'm gonna show you things on some of my other bikes so you know how to assemble a bike. Now. At the end of the video, I'm also gonna show you how to tune the bike, how to tune the derailleurs and the brakes. So if that's something, if you're at that point already, I'll have the timestamps down below. So you can just go hit those and jump forward in the video. And also at the end of the video, I'm gonna show you some things that you can do for really cheap or free to make your bike work or look better. So there's gonna be some free things and some really cheap things that you can do, some kind of little bike hacks. I'm gonna have that timestamp down below. So if you wanna skip forward to that and skip all this part, you can. Now you may have noticed over here, I've got one of my other bikes. This is kind of my primary ride. It's up on the work stand right now and that's because it's dead. It's waiting on a new drivetrain. But this bike I have up on a bike stand. I am not going to build this bike that we're building on a bike stand. I'm gonna assume you at home don't have one. So I'm gonna show you how to do it on the floor of your garage or patio with basic tools. Let's get started. Now the first thing you're gonna have to do is obviously get the bike out of the box. Now every bike that I built so far has been packaged pretty much the same way. I've already kind of popped the box open here on the top, but they're meant to be opened from the top. So if you fold everything back, they're usually packaged really well. Now I'm gonna grab the camera and show you real quick how the inside of the box looks. So looking down from the inside, you can see it's very tightly packed and everything's actually tied together with zip ties. So when you pick this thing up out of the box, it should pretty much come out as one unit. So like I had mentioned before, I'm not gonna be using the bike stand. So something you can do at this point is the bike doesn't really wanna stand up on its own. You can actually use the box, lay it down on the floor and make yourself a workspace that'll protect your bike from getting scratched up on the floor. So let's do that. So from here, like I had mentioned before, everything is gonna be held together with zip ties typically, or some sort of a plastic tie. So we can start undoing all those zip ties. You're gonna wind up with a lot of trash. Now the other thing is pretty much every bike that I've gotten shipped to me, the front wheel has not been mounted on the bike, the back wheel has been. So we're gonna get this front wheel up and out of the way. Now I like to use side cutters like this because you can usually get in underneath things and not scratch up parts. So now we've got the front wheel done. So we can get this thing out of the way. So at this point, we've got a lot of stuff stripped off the bike. I wanna point something out though. On the forks, there's a little plastic protector piece. Do not remove that. I'm gonna show you why in just a second. Another thing to note is don't mess around with the packaging up here on the headset. This little piece of cardboard up here, if you have this style of headset, is actually holding the front fork in place right now. So right now what we're gonna do, we're gonna get this thing standing upright now that it's a little bit more stripped down. We're gonna have it standing upright on the fork and we're gonna get the handlebars and headset put together. Now you can see right now I'm using the box again to hold the bike up. I have it leaned up right there because the bike still wants to tip over. So now we're gonna go and mount the handlebars. Now there are two different standards for headsets. This is what is typically called a threadless headset and then there is a threaded headset. There are some other time types out there as well, but these are the most common. So how these work, it's a little interesting how these work and it can also be a little bit of an issue putting these together because it can be a pain. You take this little top screw out so you can get the cardboard piece out. And at this point, there is nothing holding your steer tube here, nothing holding all this together. So if I pick the frame up, this whole thing would drop out. I'll show you what I mean. So if I remove these, I'm just gonna get these out of the way so I don't come tumbling off the bike. And I start picking this up, the entire steer tube is gonna come off. The whole thing will fall. So we don't want that to happen. You wanna make sure you keep all this supported so you can get everything lined up correctly. So let's get all this back together. Now what is really neat about these is these spacers. So you can take these spacers and adjust the height of your entire handlebar, your stem. So we've got our handlebar here and we've gotta keep our cables kind of organized because they're all a little out of sorts right now. So we gotta keep our cables organized. And then this guy comes in over like this. Now I'm gonna do it this way with all my spacers underneath. That's because I'm pretty tall and I generally like to have everything sitting up pretty high. Now you can also take these spacers and move them up 
and have this whole thing ride down. So you can adjust it to your own height. Now you might want to put it together this way and then once you get the bike together and ride it, get it set up for how you like it set up. And I'm gonna have instructions at the very end of this video on how to get your bike set up for you. And I'm gonna have that at the very end of the video as well. So now we've got that on there. Now the one thing you wanna do, you wanna tighten it down. This top piece is what applies pressure and pulls everything together. So you do wanna get that tight. And every time you tighten it, check your steering and make sure that it's not binding up. As long as it's not binding up, you're okay. You can apply a little bit more. Okay, so we're right at the point there where it's starting to get tight. So now we can align our handlebars to make sure that they are perfectly straight and we can tighten up these two Allen bolts here and that will tighten this whole thing together and then your installation of your fork and handlebars is done for now. So for the purposes of demonstrating the quill stem, I pulled out this beauty. This is my 1959 JC Higgins Flightliner. I love this bike. Now let me show you that stem. Now these stems are very simple. This one uses a wrench. A lot of the more current ones that you'll be using are probably gonna take an Allen key, um, but they all work pretty much the same. So you have this little bolt that you loosen up and there's a quill that runs down inside the body of the fork. That's what the guts of it looks like. This little piece slips up and down as you tighten this piece. Now a tip is if you haven't, or if it doesn't have any, put a little bit of grease in there so it has an easy time sliding up and down that when you insert it. Now when you insert it into the bike, it goes in just like so. You center it up, and then you tighten, and that's all there is to it. It's a very simple setup. Now. You notice here it has this large nut right here. This holds everything together. So with this stem out, everything will stay together, which is different than the threadless headset that I showed before. Now the next thing to tackle is the front wheel. Now on this bike, it is a quick release front hub. On other bikes, they could be bolt on or they could be through axle. Um, so I'm gonna show you the quick release first, then I'll show you real quick how the bolt ons work. And then last I'll show you the through axle on one of my other bikes. So a quick release, has a couple different parts here. So the first thing you're gonna to have to do if it didn't come already installed on the wheel is you're going to have to take off the cap. So the cap's off. Now you'll notice we have two springs. Remove one of the springs, leaving the other spring in place. Now typically, quick releases go through with the quick release, the handle on the side of the disc brake. So we're gonna feed it through from the one side. So now from here you should see the quick release, then this a little piece right here that the quick release rides on and the spring. When we flip the wheel around, we take that same spring, put it on the wheel, small side first, followed by the end cap. So now with the quick release installed on the wheel, we can install the wheel on the bike. Now before you install the wheel on the bike, you wanna make sure your brakes are open and released if there are brakes up here or if they're disc brakes. And it seems most even big box store bikes are coming with at least cable actuated disc brakes. There sometimes will be a little piece of plastic in between the discs that you'll have to remove. The last Axiom had it, this one doesn't, maybe they fell out in the box. So you wanna remove that, otherwise you can't get this in. And then I'm gonna show you the easiest way to put a wheel on a bike if you're not on a stand. This is the easiest way I've found. You actually get over the bike, then you pick the bike up, you take the wheel, roll it underneath the bike, so that way you're supporting the bike, and then you just line everything up and drop it in place. Now this is a little tricky because we do have the disc brake in there, but we've got the, the uh, wheel seated. Now we just have to tighten up that quick release. So let's get down there and I'll show you how to tighten that up. So now to tighten the quick release is really, really simple. It's what's nice about quick releases. So you'll notice right now, I can just move this thing freely and most of these will actually say open and close. So if it's open pointing out, now we know this is open. In the open position, grab the other side with your fingers and start spinning to the right. And you wanna do that till you just start feeling some resistance and then see if you can close this. If you can't close it, it's a little bit too tight. You wanna back it off slowly, trying it. And you wanna to get to the point where it's difficult but not impossible to push that up. Once that's in place now, everything is clamped in there. Your front wheel is installed. And to show how a bolt-on axle works, we're gonna go back over to that JC Higgins Flightliner and show you, it basically goes on the exact same way. The axle slips on and you just tighten up the nuts on the end of the axle. Now with a lot of these, the axle will spin freely, so you wanna have a wrench on both sides. Now this bike, and what's typical with older bikes, 
and some bikes is they may have a quick release on the front and a nut on the back. This one actually has it on both. That was the style of the older bikes at the time. Now, in the case of a lot of higher end bikes, they use something called a through axle. Now, a through axle, if the wheel is in place here, you put the wheel in and then you slide the through axle all the way through and you tighten it into place. Some of them have a quick release like this. Some of them just have an Allen head. So each type is a little bit different, but the same applies. You basically want to get it tight and then clamp it down. Or if it's one with a Allen key, you want to crank it down until it's completely tight and not moving. All right, so now your bike should be looking a little bit more like a bike. We're going to go ahead and take off all of that stuff. Now we're fortunate here because it's being held up by the kickstand and I will go on a rant about kickstands later in the video, so stay tuned. But right now we're going to remove all that packaging, get the seat on, the pedals on, and take this thing out for its first spin. So this gizmo is one of the things that really intrigued me about this bike. This is a dropper post. This bike comes already set up with a dropper post. What a dropper post is, is there's a little cable that comes up through the seat tube, connects to the bottom of the seat post, and from a little lever on your handlebar, you can change your seat height. It's just kind of like an office chair. You push the little thing and it springs up. If you're sitting on it and you push it, you can compress it down. So if you come into a rocky section or a downhill section, you want to get the bike seat out of your way, you can collapse it and then you can hit the button, pops right back up. Now, most bikes aren't going to have something like this. So what you're going to do is just insert this seat into the seat tube here and crank down the quick release the same way you would the front wheel. If it doesn't have a quick release, you're gonna tighten it up with a uh, wrench or an Allen wrench or something like that. Now, when I built the other bike, I ran into a problem with this and I'm gonna show you how to do a little bit of preventative thing here, which is gonna be probably a little bit more specific to this bike, but it'll just take a second. Now I'm trying to zoom in on this the best I can, but if you can see in the end here, there is a place to put an Allen wrench on both sides of this. And that's because there's a little set screw that holds this little end cap onto the cable. That on the other bike was not tightened down all the way. So after a couple attempts to run the post, this popped off and fell into the frame. Now we did manage to get it out of the frame, but the end of the cable was frayed and we nearly had to buy a whole new cable because of some poor assembly. So if you have something like this, make sure this part is torqued down completely. We're gonna do that right now. Oh yeah, that was extremely loose. There's, there's no way that would have held. I got almost a full turn out of that. So yeah, extremely loose. You're definitely gonna wanna have to do that if you got this bike. Now this part can be a little bit tricky. There's a little lever here and you're gonna have to feed this piece into that little lever. Now what I found the last time I built one of these was if you take any sort of a tool here and get it up underneath that thing. You can actually pry that little lever out a little bit. It makes it easier to get that in place. So let's do that real quick. Okay, so now we've got a tool kind of wedged underneath it, which gives us a little bit more room to work with this. So now, this little piece slips in like so. Gets pulled nice and tight. And now, if we come up to our handlebars and we actuate this thing, it should work just like that. So now we can install this down into the frame Tighten down our quick release and our seat is installed. So this bike, the last thing we have to install is the pedals. Now the cranks are labeled L and R for left and right and the pedals are also. Now something to note on pedals is they don't always turn the direction you think they should and that's because you don't want them coming unscrewed while you're riding. So there's two ways to install pedals. There is a way you can put a wrench around it up here or most pedals have a place where you can fit an Allen key into the back of it. Now we're gonna be using the Allen key method. We'll start threading those pedals on. Something notable about this bike is this bike actually comes with metal pedals, which is pretty awesome for this price point. So now that we've got this installed, we're gonna do the exact same thing on the other side. Something else you'll notice while I'm working on this side is you'll notice that this thing has a one by drivetrain. That is, um, if you're kind of new to the cycling world, these one bys, which is one gear in the front, has become kind of the new standard in higher end mountain bikes and seeing a one by drivetrain in a bike in this price point is pretty remarkable. Now there are some corners that were cut to get where this bike is with the dropper post, the suspension, the aluminum frame and whatnot. And we'll tackle that or talk about that at the very, very end of this video. But on the whole for the price, it's a pretty impressive bike. So now is where if you follow the instructions that came with the bike, they would say you're done and you're ready to go ride, but you're not. Um, this bike 
was built on a Friday. Not in my garage, but at the factory. That's the old expression of they want to get out of work early so they slapped it together. And I already noticed stuff wrong with it. The other bike that we got, same thing. There was some stuff that just wasn't quite set up right, wasn't adjusted right, some things I had to take care of. This bike, not safe right now going down the road. I'm gonna show you why. I sat on the bike, camera wasn't running, I wish it was, and I just did a quick brake check. Grab each brake. And I grabbed this brake and it grabbed and then it slipped all the way to the handlebar. Why did it do that? Whoever assembled this bike at the factory didn't torque down the brake cable. So you could be going down the road, car comes in front of you, you grab brake, nothing happens. But right now I'm gonna go through how to nut and bolt the bike, safety check the bike, and make sure this thing is safe to go out on the street. So let's start by checking all those cable points that just failed on me. So if you're running mechanical disc brakes, you're gonna have a cable that comes out of the cable housing down here by the back wheel, and it's gonna come up and get clamped to this brake arm here. You wanna take your Allen wrench, and it will probably be an Allen wrench, and go in there and torque that and make sure it's tight. Now the front brake here, this is the part that slipped on me. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to actually unscrew this a little bit. And yeah, I can already feel it was extremely loose. We're gonna loosen that up, pull this cable through so it's nice and tight, and then tighten it back down. And again, we wanna make sure that we really torque this down so it doesn't do what it did before, where it doesn't slip out again and possibly cause an accident. Now coming down to the derailleur, you should pretty much have the same situation. We're gonna go underneath, recheck that, and make sure that one's tight. That one feels like it was torqued down pretty well. Now you could also have a derailleur up in the front. This one doesn't, but you wanna do the same thing. Just find the place where the cable pinches in and make sure that is nice and tight. Now the next thing we're gonna do is to come in here and adjust these brakes. Now when you pull the brake lever in, the brake pad should make contact with the disc or with the rim about a third of the throw in, but a lot of this is also your preference. Now, if you're pulling the brake lever in way too far, you can adjust it out with these barrel adjusters. Now, how the barrel adjusters work is they basically put more tension on the cable. So, you unscrew these out, and by unscrewing these out, you're putting more tension on the cable, and now the lever won't come in as far to contact the rotor. Once you have it set, where you like it, you bring this little piece back out, get them in place just like that, and now it's set in place. You've got your brakes adjusted. Now you wanna adjust these in a way that's comfortable for you. Now the other thing you can do is if you've got very small hands, when you adjust these, you want it so the lever falls kind of around your last knuckle. But if you've got small hands, there's also a set screw right here. You can tighten down that set screw and it'll actually bring the lever in so you can adjust how far out the lever sits when you're not using it. Now the next thing to think about is seat height and seat angle. So the seat height is how high it is and the angle is forward or backwards pitch. Now seat angle is really going to be more of a comfort thing, but it is something you can adjust and a lot of people don't realize you can adjust your seat angle. But first let's set the seat height. This is also a personal preference thing. Now, most mountain bikers and road bikers will tell you that the seat needs to be set high so your legs are almost fully extended when your pedal is at a full downstroke. So I'll show you what that looks like here. So on this bike, if I'm sitting on the saddle and my leg is here, it's almost fully extended. So that is where most cyclists would want it. They may even want it a little bit higher. Like I said, that's a matter of preference. If you're riding this thing and it's a comfort bike and it's a cruiser, you may not want it that high. So really set it up for you and how you like it. Now, let me show you how to adjust the seat angle. Now, I usually, when I set my bike up, I like to have the seat pretty well level, but I do ride with people that like it tilted a little forward and I also ride with people that like it tilted a little back. So it's really up to you how you like it. But let me show you how you would adjust it on this kind of a bike. So on this style seat post, there are two Allen screws. On some of these, there'll be one. And you loosen these up and then you can rock the entire seat forward or back. This one happens to actually be already set pretty much where I like it, so I'm not gonna touch it. Now there is another style that has a bolt that goes straight through. Same thing, you loosen up that bolt, you can change the angle and you can actually slide it forward or back about two inches. You can see you got a little extra room on those rails in there. And um, this seat on this bike, not the most comfortable seat. I'm gonna have a suggestion for a cheap, comfortable seat at the very end of this video, if that's something you're interested in. So after you get this and this setup, we're gonna move over to the controls. 
And when I say the controls, we're really adjusting the angle of the brake levers and the shifter and this, this is the um, dropper post lever that they installed upside down and sideways. So another thing they screwed up at the factory. So we're gonna back these bolts out here on the stem. Don't take them all the way out. You just wanna get it loose enough that you can rotate the handlebar. So we've got our bar loosened up. We've got our seat where we want it. Now we're gonna turn the bars. And generally what you want is you want those brake levers to be so your whole arm is a straight line. If you're sitting in your normal seated position, your arms, everything is straight, and then your fingers are straight. So turn those bars until you get it to that point. And then once it's at that point, we're gonna tighten those right back down. And when you tighten these back down, you wanna go in a cross pattern. So you'll tighten here, 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 and go around until you've got it completely torqued down. That way you know you've applied torque evenly all the way around your stem. Don't forget to air up the tires. Now air pressure is another thing that's a pretty personal thing. Everybody has their specific air pressures and I haven't actually worked out what I like on these tires yet. I've been playing around with my daughter's bike. I'm gonna put probably 30 pounds of air in it. I'm probably gonna back it off. That's actually a little higher than even what I ride on my, uh, on my mountain bike. But we're gonna bring it up to 30 right now. All right, so I've put 30 pounds of air in the front. I'm gonna do the same in the back. On the side of your tires, it should read something like this. This has inflated 35 or 25 to 45 PSI, but every bike and every tire and every inner tube is gonna be different. So follow the directions on your bike. But like I said, it's pretty personal. Usually people that ride on the street have higher tire pressure than people that ride in the dirt. On my mountain bike, I run uh, 27, 24. I put 27 in the rear, 24 in the front and uh, that's what works well for that bike. But every bike, every wider rider weight, everything's gonna be different. So play around with tire pressures, figure out what's right and safe for you. Now you wanna head outside, go for a spin and bed in the brakes. Yeah, okay. And bedding in the brakes is real simple. You're just gonna get the yeah. bike up to speed and then apply the brakes, get the bike almost to a stop and repeat it 10 or 15 times or until the brakes start working better and quieter. Then you're all done. So now that we've got it outside, we've bedded in the brakes, it's time to do a little adjustment on the shifters if they need it. This bike needed just a little bit out of the box. The other one needed a little bit more. So let me show you the easiest way to adjust the shifter. So the quick and dirty explanation about how derailers work, you've got a cable that comes in and this cable pulls the derailleur and it pulls it this way and this way to change gears on the bike. Now it has limit screws right here and it has a barrel adjuster right here. The barrel adjuster is pretty much the same as the barrel adjuster that we had up on the brakes. Now on this bike, there's a barrel adjuster here and one up on the shifter. Sometimes you'll find them not down here and just up on the shifter. It's just going to depend on what model you have. Now, if you run into the situation where as you are shifting that way, and these, this is your downhill gear, this is your climbing gear. So the largest gear is your climbing gear. Smallest gear is your downhill gear. If you run into the situation where as you are shifting towards that direction so trying to get into an easier gear the thing isn't totally making it up into the next gear you want to turn your barrel shifter to the left and give it a little bit more cable tension if it's jumping too far like it's shifting one gear and then trying to make it to the next you reduce cable tension that's the easiest way to do it now you want to do it through the entire range so usually these have clicks so you'll click it once try to shift all the way through the range if it's still not shifting quite right click it one more time. Count how many clicks you do, that way you can return back if you've gone too far. The other adjustment are these set screws here, and the set screws control how far in the extreme this way or this way the derailleur can go. So with the derailleur bottomed out all the way down here, you can adjust your set screw if the chain is tending to hop off the gear that direction, and then the same thing goes this way. Now the way these work is you've got a low and a high, this being your low gear, this being your high gear. So your low is going to be if it's going too far this way, high is if it's going too far that way. You turn them in to bring the limit in further. So your front derailleur works pretty much the same way. This is your front derailleur and that moves your chain between your low and your high gears. Now these also will have those same limit adjusters and that adjusts the far throw that the derailleur can go, whether it's high or low. So when you turn those in, it brings the derailleur inward. So if it's tending to flop the chain on this side, you can turn in your high. If it's going too far towards the frame, you can turn in your low. This one also has the barrel adjuster. On this one, there is no barrel adjuster on the derailleur itself. It's up on the handlebars, but the same thing applies. If you need to put a little bit more tension in it because it's not completing the shift, you turn it left, less tension, 
you turn it right. So that is your front derailleur. So as promised, end of the video, I'm gonna show you a couple things that you can do for free and a couple things you can do for very cheap to make this bike look better, perform better, and hold up longer. So let's start with an issue with the chain. So this bike's derailleur is a little bit more of a budget derailleur, which means no clutch. No clutch means chain slap, which means that chain is slapping against your chain stay, chipping up the paint. Here are some easy ways to prevent that from happening. First, the freeway, and albeit probably not the prettiest way, but it's effective. This is on my other mountain bike. I just wrapped a inner tube and zip tied it in place around the chain stay. And now when the chain slaps, you can see a little dents there. This one actually has a clutch, but I ride this thing so hard it still slaps sometimes. Um, it prevents that, and it also makes it quiet. So when it hits that, you don't hear it. Now let me show you the cheap option. This is the cheap option. This is a uh, neoprene guard that you can get on Amazon. I actually got three of these for like, I think 11 bucks. So I got one for each bike um, and it wraps around with Velcro and it protects your chain stay. So that's the inexpensive option. The next free fix is these are lock on grips and they don't work. I don't know why they put these on this bike. I know they're trying to check off boxes and one of the boxes is a lot of high end bikes have lock on grips, but if they don't work, what's the point? So these ones, you're supposed to be able to tighten up with a screw right there, but if you can see, they're completely tight. They can't go any tighter and it just spins in circles. So if you have loose grips, the easiest way to fix these is with stuff around your house. On this one, you'll have to unscrew that, slip it off, spray the handlebar with hairspray, slip it back on, let it dry for an hour. That'll never come off. But if you do have to take it off, you insert a little screwdriver underneath the grip, spray a little bit of water in there, rotate it, the hairspray will break free and you can pull the whole grip off. Quick, easy tip. Now the seat the Axum comes with isn't terrible, but it's not also the most comfortable. Now I didn't want to get a big gel beach cruiser seat. So I found this one for my daughter's bike and it's a gel seat. It's very comfortable, but it still has the form of a mountain bike seat. It's not going to be so big that it gets in your way. And this was only about 20 bucks. Um, I actually bought a second one for uh, my Axum that I'm building right now. So that'll be going on it in the next video. Now also on my daughter's bike, we changed out the stem and the grips. Now this wasn't just for looks. We actually wanted to shorten up the bike a little bit. This is a medium, but she is still a little bit too short for a medium. So we shortened up the neck here. So this brought some distance out of the, what they call the cockpit of the bike, which is the length between where your grips are and your seat is. And it looks pretty cool. And these things you can get on Amazon for about 10 to 12 bucks. And then we got matching lock on grips to fix that grip problem. So between the grips and that, I think we were under 20 bucks, but it really dresses up the front of the bike and makes it yours. So I'm gonna have links for those down below, but I'm gonna have a whole other video where we hop up one of these bikes. And that video will be linked down below once it's done. Now what we're gonna be doing, we're not done with the Axum, at least my Axum on the channel. It's gonna be back again, and we're gonna be hopping the whole thing up with name brand components. Not the cheap stuff that a lot of other people are doing where they're getting stuff that's knockoff. We're gonna be using quality name brand stuff, but I'm gonna show you where to get it cheap and we're going to be building up that bike into a real competitive hardtail kind of cross-country bike so it should be a good video i'm going to have it linked down below once it's up but be sure to hit that subscribe button and then it'll let you know when it's on there now i hope you enjoyed this video give it a great big thumbs up if it helped you out at all and if you have any questions on your setup or anything else leave it down below i'm happy to help you out and of course thanks for watching